Okay. I'll wait another minute or so just to make sure if anyone else is going to join. I know it's a holiday, but we've got three big blue buttons and I'm trying to spread them out. Everybody have a good holiday, I hope, and trying to stay warm. Quite cold here for Alabama. Uh, Natalie asked about my shoulder. Yes, I had surgery in October and it's doing much better now. I had surgery uh, uh, in May to repair a labrum and then I had a lot of scar tissue and they went back in and cleaned all that up to get my shoulder moving better and can do pretty much everything now. So uh, it's not too bad. You know, it, it's, uh, you recover pretty quick. You just have to do a lot of PT. Okay. So today we're going to talk about interpretation of cervical screening cytology or pap smears. Um, pap smears are uh, becoming less often because of the new guidelines uh, and the realization that over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years that HPV really is the culprit and so uh, targeting HPV screening has allowed us to uh, stretch out the So um, cervical cancer is something that grows very slowly. Uh, it is primarily due to uh, infection with HPV virus. And uh, the reason that we have gone from screening young teenagers, when I first started working at the health department, we would screen everybody that came in for birth control. If they were 15, they would get a pap smear. Uh, now we realize that almost all teenagers that are sexually active are going to be positive for HPV. Uh, one of the uh, conferences I went to a few years ago said it's more a marker of sexual activity than anything because it is so common. But a good number of those patients uh, will clear the virus on their own due to their competent immune system. And so if we started doing pap smears on every 16, 17, 18 year old we, that was sexually active, we'd be sending them all for colposcopy and cervical biopsy and everything because they all had dysplasia or a, uh, you know, changes in cells due to HPV. So now we don't do uh, pap smears until 21, give them a chance to uh, clear that HPV. So, uh, the important thing with uh, pap smears and being a uh, family nurse practitioner is knowing when you need to refer and when you can just follow the patient on your own. Um, make sure your mics are muted. Somebody. Not sure which one I muted. <laughs> Just make sure you mute your uh, phone if you're calling in on your phone. So um, knowing how to interpret the pap smear results that you're getting uh, when you send them to the lab and knowing which patients you can safely follow with follow-up screening and which ones need to be referred for colposcopy and further testing is important. You don't want to refer every single person with an abnormal pap to go have a colposcopy. That's just um, not necessary. So there are two types of pap tests. One is called a conventional, and with this, the cervical cells are collected using a wooden spatula or brush and placed on a slide. This is the least expensive me method. Uh, this is what I did for years at the health department. We saved liquid prep for uh, people that had known problems. But uh, this one, this is the slide and a uh, wooden spatula and then and the cervical brush that we would use. And we would just go around the cervix um, in a clockwise, you know, like a clockwise motion with the spatula and then wipe it onto the slide and then insert the brush into the endocervical canal and 
put that on the slide and use some fixative, and then that would go to the lab for evaluation. The other method is called a liquid prep, and the cervical cells are obtained with what they call a broom and placed in a bottle containing liquid. And the residual liquid can also be used for HPV testing on that same sample. So this is a liquid prep, and it does have a spatula sometime. Usually it has this broom, which is a little silicone, um, almost like a pastry brush, uh, little silicone bristles that are very soft that you, you use to get the outside of the cervix, and then it does uh, sometime have an endocervical uh, brush, and you just kind of swish it. With these um, brooms, a lot of times this is detachable and can stay in the container, and then if you have the, the broom or the brush, you just kind of swish it in the liquid to get the cells off of it. Uh, with the conventional path, you can't do HPV testing. You have to have liquid to do that. So if you've done a conventional path and they may need HPV testing, you need to go back and do one of these. So a lot of practices now have gone to just doing liquid prep. Um, Brittany asks if colposcopies are done by SMPs. Most likely not. To do colposcopies, you need special training and then to be certified by the um, oh, I don't remember the name. It's like the American Society of Colposcopy something. It's who gives these guidelines, and I'll look up the name of it. But to get certified, you have to do so many colposcopies a year. They have to be reviewed at the beginning, and um, it's you know quite a bit of work. And you probably would not be doing enough of them unless you were working at a women's health center. I mean, if you you know, as an FMP worked just at a women's health clinic and were responsible for doing that, then you probably, you know, could go and get trained and do that. There's nothing to say you can't do it. It's just that it, you have to do a lot of them. Okay. So let's first go over some definitions that you're going to see when you get your reports back. So cytology is examination of the cervical cells, and this is done from the cells that are obtained during the pap smear, either conventional or liquid pap, and it's used, it's reported uh, according to what is called the Bethesda system. We're going to go over that. And then histology is examination of tissues that are obtained during cervical biopsy. So most of the time you're not going to be doing that. And this is uh, interpreted using the CIN nomenclature, more than more both of those. But you may see reports, so you, you need to know the terminology. So this is the histology terms. This is what you would see on a biopsy. And it's the uh, cervical interepithelial neoplasia, or CIN, are the uh, terms that they go by. And this is a disordered growth and development of the epithelial lining of the cervix. This used to be called dysplasia. Uh, a lot of you may have heard that term before. It's divided into high and low grade lesions. CIN1 is a low grade lesion. CIN2 or 3 are high grade lesions. And then CIS is carcinoma in situ. And these all are made after cervical biopsy. So when someone goes for a colposcopy and they take little punch biopsies of any abnormal looking areas of the cervix, uh, this is how they report them. Now, you're going to see a lot of reports of cytology or just the pap smear reports. And these are reported using the Bethesda system, and this is what you'll read on a report. First, they're going to talk about adequacy of the sample, and it's either satisfactory or unsatisfactory. And as a student, do ask your women's health provider, you know, your um, nurse practitioner or physician preceptor, to let you know if you get any unsatisfactory um, pap smears, because most likely you will. Um, biggest thing to tell you is finding the cervix is not that easy. Uh, Sometimes you, know, you put that speculum in and it's just right there, and uh, about 60, 70 percent of the time it's not right there, and you do have to hunt a little bit. It can be located, it can be tipped down, tipped up to the side. Uh, if you have a woman that is um, heavy, or has had a lot of children that has a lot of laxity in the vaginal tissues, it can be quite difficult to find. 
If you can't find it, get help. Don't just go in there with the pap and rub around at anything <laughs> that is pink. Uh, you need to be sampling the cervix. So uh, the first thing you look at on the report is whether it's satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Unsatisfactory means that there are not enough cervical cells to evaluate. You might have uh, vaginal epithelial cells, but that's not where cervical cancer grows. So uh, that's the first thing you look at. A normal PAP is reported as negative for interepithelial lesion or malignancy. That's what you should see. Uh, there are some benign changes that don't represent cancer, and those could be things, in, uh, infections such as a yeast infection, candida, or trichomonas, uh, inflammation from any number of things, or uh, atopy, and these are listed under the comments section. So you might see a comment that says, you know, positive for uh, candida. And then ECTZ, absent or insufficient. And this means that there were either no or an insufficient number of endocervical cells. The, this is the area where the squamous cells meet the glandular cells in the endocervical canal. It's called the transformation zone or the TZ. And this is where cancer is most likely to develop. Uh, this is when you use the little broom to go into the cervix and, and twist it around. And um, that's where that... Uh, transformation zone is. So if you didn't get enough of those cells, uh, it will be reported. Um, a lot of times as women age, the transformation zone migrates up and you have to go further into the endocervical canal to get those. So you might get a pap smear that says that's insufficient. Okay, now what do abnormal results look like? The Probably the most common one that you'll see, we call ASCUS, or A-S-C-U-S, and this means atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance. So there's something going on, they just don't really know what. It doesn't look scary, it doesn't look uh, malignant, but some of the cells are changing. This is usually due to infection or inflammation of some kind, uh, and it's very common. Okay. Uh, ASGH is atypical cellular uh, squamous, that should be A. I'm sorry, that should be ASC, I'm going to have to change that. Uh, atypical squamous cells uh, cannot exclude high-grade squamous inner epithelial lesions. So this one's a little more concerning because uh, they can't say that there is or, and they can't exclude that there could be a high-grade lesion. LSIL is low-grade squamous interepithelial lesion. And remember, we talked about you know, high and low-grade. HSIL is high-grade squamous interepithelial lesion. And AGC is atypical glandular cells. Okay, so this, I'm going to go back and correct. This should say ASC-H, atypical squamous cells. I'll go back and correct that. So what do you do when you get one of these reports back? You know, you've got a patient that came in for screening, doesn't have any problems, and you get back an abnormal report. So as an FMP, you're going to do a lot of pap smears if you're in a GYN practice or a family practice, and you know, need to know which ones need to be referred for colposcopy and which ones you can safely just continue to screen. And there are some algorithms uh, on the following slide, and we're going to go over those. Um, Lisa asked, would you refer biopsy for all ASCUS? No, we're going to go over these slides and I'll go through the algorithms for what you're going to do. Okay, so notice that the management on these algorithms varies by the age of the patient. And again, this is because um, as women start having sexual intercourse and are exposed to HPV, um, you know, either in their teens or 20s, uh, most of them will have some type of changes in the cervix, and given time, a lot of those changes will uh, disappear as the patient's immune system um, welches that HPV. So the, the treatment and the uh, management is going to be a little different depending on their age. Uh, okay, so remember that PAPs 
screening, again, does not start until age 21, and that routine HPV screening or co-testing doesn't start until age 30. Again, that's, you know, why do we not screen for HPV in the 21-year-old? Well, they're going to be positive. <laughs> Almost all of them are going to be positive. And, you know, you get a positive result, and then uh, it makes you think you have to do a lot more uh, invasive procedures. So we want to give them time to clear that first. Okay. So this is management of patients with unsatisfactory uh, pap smears. Remember, this was where they didn't have enough of those cells present. So you either didn't test the cervix, you know, you were uh, scraping the vaginal wall or, or uh, something else. But either way, there are not enough cervical cells there to evaluate. If um, they're any age and their HPV status is unknown, you know, either they're less than 30 and haven't ever had HPV testing done, or they're over 30 and they just haven't had it done, they've only had conventional. Then you just repeat psychology in two to four months. Again, if they're under 30, just repeat a regular, uh, not with HPV, just a regular pap. If they're HPP negative and they're over 30, say you, you did a liquid prep and they were able to, you did co-testing, you, you know, you wanted a pap smear and uh, HPV co-testing. Um, they didn't have enough cervical cells to do the pap smear, but their HPV was negative. You just repeat the pap smear in two to four months. If they're HPV positive and they're over 30, you have two options. You can either go ahead and send them for colposcopy, or you can repeat it in two to four months. Uh, cervical cancer is not a fast-growing cancer, so either of those options are acceptable. Either repeat it or, uh, you know, because if you wait and repeat it in two months, then hopefully you'll get the endocervical are the cervical cells and you can tell whether it's a high grade lesion or whether it's just abscess or something. So either uh, HPV positive over 30, either repeat in two to four months or do colposcopy. After repeating it, if it's abnormal, you know, you get the pap smear and it says high grade interepsidal lesion or something like that, you're going to go by the, the guidelines. And these are the guidelines that American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, the one that certifies you. Uh, these are their guidelines, and we're going to go over the slides. If it's negative, you get that pap smear back and everything is fine. You just go right back to routine screening. Um, uh, if their HPV uh, is unknown or negative, routine screening, you know, say they're under 30, you're not doing HPV, or they're negative, just routine screening, or co-testing in one year if their HPV is positive. Again, this is only people over 30 because you're not testing for HPV under 30. If you get that cervical uh, cytology back and it's unsatisfactory again, go to colposcopy. Okay, so uh, the cytology is negative for interepithelial lesion or malignancy. That's the normal result that we want to see. But that endocervical and transformation zone is absent or insufficient. So remember I said when you do the pap smear, you use the broom or the spatula. That gets the outside of the cervix. Those of you that have gone for uh, intensives have probably done the pap smear um, skills lab. And they talk about getting the sample from the outside of the cervix, which kind of looks like a donut, and then the uh, endocervical canal is kind of the hole in the donut that you're going to go into with the little brush to get that transformation zone. If that is absent or insufficient and they're under 30, then you just continue to do routine screen. Okay. If they're, they're 30 or over and they have, you did co-testing, they had negative HPV, just continue to do your regular screening. If their HPV is unknown, maybe you did just a, a conventional PAP and you didn't do co-testing, then the preferred thing is to go ahead and test them for HPV so that you know. And if it's negative, just go back to routine screening. Um, if it's positive, then we're going to go over here. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the other thing, if their HPV is unknown, you can just say, let's repeat it again in three years. That is acceptable but the preferred would be to go ahead and do the HPV testing or co-testing. Okay. 
If you do this and their HPV is positive, you can either do genotyping to see what type of HPV they have, whether they have the high risk type, types like 16 or 18. Uh, there are many different genotypes of HPV and not all of them are high risk for cancer. Or you can just repeat the cytology and HPV in one year and then manage them for, uh, for the guidelines, okay? So insufficient um, or absent TZ zone, under 30, just continue to screen. Over 30 with negative HPV, continue to screen routinely. Over 30 with positive HPV, genotyping, unknown HPV, do HPV test, that's preferred. Okay. So now you've come to women over 30 who have negative psychology, that, uh, that were negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, that's the cells on the cervix, but their HPV is positive. Uh, you can do one of two things. You can, uh, you can do co-testing again, repeat that HPV and cytology in one year. That's acceptable. If it comes back negative, they've cleared that HPV and their cytology is still negative, then you go back to every three years. Uh, if you do that co-testing again in one year and either they have ASCUS or they have HPV still positive, then you go to colposcopy. Another option is to do HPV DNA testing. This is the genotyping. If they are negative for HPV 16 or 18, those are the two types that are high risk, you go back to co-testing in one year. And if they were positive, they go to colposcopy. Okay, so then this is management of ASCUS. Remember, this is the one I said you're probably going to see the most of. And this is in women over age 24. Again, we're not doing HPV testing on these until they get over 30. So if you get a pap smear on a you know, 24, 25, 26-year-old that is reported as ASCUS, atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, then you can repeat cytology at one year. That is acceptable. Or you can do HPV testing. Um, and this is the preferred. And again, this is, you know, for, for routine screening under 30, we're not doing HPV testing. So she wouldn't have had an HPV test on this, on this pap smear that's coming back abnormal. Now that her pap smear is abnormal, you can go ahead and do the HPV test. Okay? So you can either just repeat the cytology at one year. This is acceptable. If it's negative, go right back to routine screening. If it's still ASCUS, then go to colposcopy. Preferred method would be to go ahead and test her for HPV. If it's negative, go back to repeat co-testing at three years. So again, because she's had an HPV uh, uh, test already, you can continue to do that at three-year intervals. If her HPV is positive, then you go to colposcopy. So this is the only time you're going to do HPV testing under 30 is if they have uh, ASCUS or higher, anything ASCUS or worse on their pap smear. Okay. So here's management of women in that younger age, the 21 to 24, with either ASCUS or a low-grade squamous interepithelial lesion. So there are a couple things you can do. You can do uh, the HPV testing, which um, is, a, is only if they have ASCUS, just like we did on this 24-year-old. We you know, went ahead and did HPV testing. So this is acceptable if they have ASCUS only. Not if they have low grade, but if they have ASCUS. If the HPV is negative, they go right back to low grade screening because ASCUS is, you know, Again, ASCUS is kind of like there's something not right there, but it doesn't look suspicious. So go ahead and test them for HPV and go back to routine screening if it's negative. If their HPV is positive, you can repeat the cytology in 12 months. That's the preferred method. Um, you re 
repeat it and it's negative, ASCUS or low grade, you keep repeating it at 12 month intervals. After two negative screenings, then they go back to normal uh, screening routine. If it continues to be ASCUS after that repeat uh, cytology, then they go for colposcopy. If when you repeat that cytology, they have anything higher than ASCUS or low grade, so they have uh, uh, Atypical squamous cells, high-grade lesions cannot be excluded. Atypical granular cells or high-grade squamous interepithelial lesion, they're going to go for colposcopy. Uh, almost all uh, management of all other PAPs, almost all others besides ASCUS are going to require further testing. Low-grade interepithelial lesion in greater than uh, a patient that's 30 or over with a negative HPV test uh, can repeat co-testing at 12 months, that's preferred, or you can go ahead and send them for colposcopy. If their HPV is unknown then they, uh, uh, or positive, then you should go ahead and send them for colposcopy. Uh, atypical or squamous cells, high-grade lesion, all get colposcopy even if their HPV is negative because this is saying, you know, we can't exclude that there's a high-grade lesion there. Uh, high-grade uh, squamous interepithelial lesion all go for colposcopy and some will just go right to doing a LEAP procedure, which is a, a, a pr procedure that the GYN will do where they remove part of the cervical cell or part of the cervical surface. And, um, they try to be more conservative in that young group. You know, if you did the first uh, pap smear when they were 22 and it came back with a high-grade uh, interepithelial lesion, they try to manage those a little more conservatively because doing leak procedures can cause the cervix to be incompetent, and if they haven't had any children yet, that can cause problems in their pregnancy. And then atypical granular cells, all of those go for uh, colposcopy and endometrial. Sampling. So the only thing you're really going to manage is the pap smears where you didn't get enough cells. <laughs> you know, you, it was insufficient. You can, you know, repeat those. The pap smears on patients that are um, have ASCUS, and you can manage those by co-testing for HPV and repeating the test. And then anything that comes back positive, almost all of those are going to get referred. Let me go over and look at some questions. If women are under 30, pregnant, and have abnormal PAP, would we still do HPV testing or would we treat cytology for pregnant patients or repeat cytology? Um, if they're under 30, pregnant, and have abnormal PAP, um, I would probably refer them, you know, let their, G their OB handle that because there are different... Um, things that they do when they're pregnant. They're not going to do the procedures while they're pregnant. So um, I would let their OBGYN manage that. They'll probably just wait and repeat the PAP right after delivery. Uh, when you go, Lindsay asks, when you go back to routine screening in this example, would you screen again in one year uh, or not again until they are 30? Um, which example Lindsay, which example are you talking about? And I'll tell you which one. And then Shannon asks, is HPV the most common cause of ASCUS? ASCUS can be um, related to anything that causes inflammation. So if they have uh, a cervicitis, if they have an STD, uh, if they have candida, if they have trichomonas, um, you know, uh, if they have a bad bacterial vaginosis, it, it, you know, candida and BV are not STDs but you know, they are infections and they are inflammatory, or if they have chlamydia or gonorrhea or something else, any of those things, if they had a PAP during that, because remember, most people that have um, chlamydia don't know it, so they're asymptomatic. So if they just come in for their routine uh, GYN visit and have a PAP and they had chlamydia, they're most likely gonna have an abnormal PAP smear because of the inflammation of the cell. So it's not, necessarily due to HPV uh, ASCUS, it, it, cervical, anything higher than that, yes, is probably due to HPV, but just ASCUS just means that 
something doesn't look right, we're not sure what it is. We don't, that's why it's undetermined significance. Don't know if it's significant or not. Just keep an eye on it. Okay, and Lindsay is asking in the 24, 21 to 24 year old. So let's go back to that. Okay, so here's the management of the 21 to 24 year old with ASCUS or low grade squamous interopophilia lesions. So you're going to do the, the preferred, um, preferred method is just to repeat their cytology in 12 months, but you can do uh, HPV testing. Um, so even if you do the HPV testing, you're just going to repeat cytology in 12 months if you do it and it's positive because they're so young. Remember, we're wanting to let them clear it. If their HPV is negative, you go back to routine screening, which would be every three years. Okay? Um, and then, you know, if, it, if their HPV is positive and you've repeated it, you, um, and it comes back negative ASCUS or low grade, you repeat it again in 12 months. After those two times, so there's, you know, here's 2018, it comes back, uh, so you do it in one year in 2019, one year in 2020. If those are both negative, you go back to every three years. Okay. Uh, will you repeat what we will manage as MPs? Okay. Um, oh, let me... Um, as NPs, you will manage, um, you know, you'll manage pretty much anybody that's coming in just for routine screening. As long as they just have um, ASCUS, then you're probably going to continue to screen them. Um, if they're under 30, then you may not know whether they have HPV. If they're, you know, 24 to 30 and they have ASCUS, you're going to do the HPV testing. And if it's positive, they're going to go for colposcopy. So basically, anybody with ASCUS and negative uh, HPV, you're going to just continue to do pap smears on. Anything more than that, um, you know, most of them, uh, anything more than that are going to go for colposcopy. You know, the uh, ASCUS, or not ASCUS, but atypical squamous cells, high grade atypical granular cells, or HS, um, high, high grade squamous interepithelial lesion, all are going to go for colposcopy. So you're going to be doing ASCUS with negative HPV, basically. Okay. Anything else you're going to probably need to refer. Uh, there was one up here. Textbook ind indicates strong link with HPV and cigarette smoking. Yes, cigarette smoking is one of the risk factors for cervical cancer. So one more <laughs> reason not to smoke cigarettes. Uh, Lindsay said, uh, so it makes sense to just do a conventional PAP on a female less than 30 because we aren't testing HPV anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's less expensive. Um, a lot, you know, until you get into your GYN clinic, you won't know, but a lot of GYN clinics now only carry liquid prep because, you know, they don't want to have to carry two different systems. Um, but when you do the lab slip, um, you don't test, you don't check uh, HPV testing. So, um, yeah, that's basically, you know, you should just be doing the pap smear, the cytology and not the HPV testing unless something comes back abnormal. Uh, otherwise, it would be better to do liquid prep. Yeah, on everybody over 30, I would try to do a liquid prep if possible because that way you, you know, we want to do that co-testing on, you know, everybody over 30. I don't have the the, there is a PowerPoint, I think it's narrated one, in the lessons on um, the guidelines for PAP um, screening, you know, how often to do it, and after 30, co-testing is the, the norm, and that means testing both cytology and HPV. So over 30, I would definitely do a liquid prep if you can do it, you know, if they have it available for you. Um, like I said, in the health, and it's been, seven years since I was in the health department, so things might have changed, uh, but they, they made us do a, a regular conventional PAP, and then if it was abnormal, do the HPV testing. They weren't doing the co-testing at the time. Um, okay, so in this population, 24 to 30, so that is positive for ASCUS, 
would you do STD testing prior to the HPV test since we are trying to be conservative with this group? Yeah, I would always do, um, I mean, the guidelines for when you, you probably had them in, I know you had them in 571, the guidelines for STD screening is all women under 27 uh, as a routine to screen, you know, during their GYN exam, screen them for uh, GC and chlamydia and over 27 as needed. I mean, um, if you have, you know, when you have a woman come in for her normal GYN exam, you know, you should ask her, um, you know, about the number of sexual partners. Does she have any new partners? Is she having any symptoms or anything like that? And go ahead and test if there's any uh, indication that she is at risk for an STD because those definitely can cause ASCUS. If they're positive for STD, would you do the, the HPV test? If, um, yeah, you probably would go ahead and test for the HPV anyway, because if you're doing the liquid prep, you might as well. And you know, this is the preferred treatment for ASCUS in women 24 to 30 would be to go ahead and do the HPV testing. Uh, what about the management of uh, low-grade squamous interepithelial lesion over 30 um, with negative HPV um, and, and I'm I don't I'd have to go back to the full guidelines I think after 30 pretty much everything okay uh, greater than 30 with negative HPV you do co-testing again in 12 months otherwise you um, the other option is to go ahead and do colposcopy on those so, um, you said management of LSI, uh, low grade squamous interrupted lesion over 30 with negative HPV, then you're going to repeat the co testing in 12 months. Um, if it's positive, they're going to go for colposcopy. Okay. Um, I think last semester we learned you do co testing over 30 every five years is okay. Yes as opposed to every three years we just a PAP. That is correct. And um, you can see my, there is a PAP guidelines uh, PowerPoint under lessons. And make sure I, the PAP PowerPoint in lessons corresponds to the readings that you have in the book that are in the later chapter under cervical cancer. The uh, beginning of the book in Deterney where you have a uh, chapter on just routine GYN care and I think I have it highlighted and in yellow on the textbook readings. Those are inaccurate. They're saying every year starting at 18 and whoever edited that section of the book missed that because they haven't been every, you know, they have, we haven't been doing them on 18 year olds in about 10 years. So somebody needs to update that section but I did you know, highlight that under your readings that that is not correct. Go by the, the guidelines that are either at the end of the book or that are in my uh, PowerPoint on pap smears. So yes, every five years co-testing for HPV and cytology is acceptable or conventional pap every three years. Okay. Um, is that, okay, Brittany said is that for H, uh family practice, uh, family FMP management. Yeah, you could do that. You, you know, um, what she's asking is if they had low grade, if they're over 30 and had low grade squamous interrupted lesion, you can co-test them for HPV if they didn't have that done. Um, and if it's negative for HPV, just go ahead and co-test again in 12 months. Um, you could send them for colposcopy. That is an acceptable alternative, you know, uh, but you can just, you know, the preferred method is to do HPV co-testing in 12 months. If their HPV is unknown or positive, refer for colposcopy. Um, I don't know why you, you know, you couldn't just do another uh, test and find out whether they're positive for HPV. I think that would be acceptable. Um, but yes, the FMP can do this. As long as you're not having to do colposcopy, every, you know, the SMP can do all the pap smears in the world. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? How long do the labs hold on to specimens? Um,
could you call and add an HPV? Uh, Natalie's asking, it, how long does the lab hold on to the specimens, and could you call and add on an HPV? Like, say you did a liquid prep on this person, um, but you didn't check off the HPV. I don't know. You would have to check with your individual lab, so you, you know, check with your preceptor, and that's a good question to ask your preceptor. I've been out of the PAP business for about seven years, so I, you know, I can't really remember how long we had to send ours to the state lab and I don't remember how long they held on to them. But I would imagine that they would hold on to them for a couple of weeks at least, and you probably you know, could get those back and say, go ahead and add on an HPV and find out whether it was positive. And that way, if it's positive, you're gonna refer them for a colposcopy and you, wouldn't, you, know, you could not have this unknown HPV status. Uh, okay. For exam purposes, do we need to understand all the treatments for uh, carcinoma? No, you would not be doing those. I think it's important for you to um, read it and, and have a general understanding of it so that if you, you know, see a patient on follow-up and they come in and they have, you know, a high-grade intraepithelial lesion and they're 34 years old, most likely they're going to have a colposcopy and or a leak procedure. So it would be nice for you to be able to say, you know, we're going to refer you on because this is probably what's going to happen. You know, now you're going to be in a GYN office, so you're probably going to have your preceptor come in with you to talk about that. But if you were, you know, in a family practice and got that back, you know, you wouldn't want to just say, well, I don't know, we're referring you. I don't know what they're going to do to you. So it is good to have an understanding of how those things will be managed so you can give them at least a little information before they head out the door because it might be a couple weeks before they get a referral and that's you know a long time to wait. So um, I'm not going to test you on these uh, treatments for it, but you should have a general understanding of that. Any other questions? I think our big blue button on Wednesday is on contraceptive methods. We're going to go over all the different uh, options for contraceptions. And then um, following Monday, I'm going to go over the case studies on STDs. Um, best way to do those is first to look at all those, excuse me, PowerPoints. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a text for the way. Uh, look at all those. Uh, STD PowerPoints, read through those, and then go through the case studies to see if you can understand how to manage those. A lot of students get really overwhelmed with the STD things, thinking there are so many medications. There really aren't. There, you know, there's Herceptin for gonorrhea and azithromycin. There's azithromycin or doxy for chlamydia. There's um, uh, the uh, trichomonas is flagell or metronidazole, and those are the STDs. And then, you know, uh, things like uh, uh, BV, you use flagell, but that's not an STD. And then there's the antifungals that you use for candida, which is not an STD. But, you know, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas, there's, you know, there's only like four medicines to learn. And then, um, you know, the uh, antivirals for, um, my mind is just going blank, the antivirals for, um, H, for herpes and penicillin for syphilis <laughs> and, you know, and um, then HPV, which is a sexually transmitted disease, has a lot of different treatments, but those are pretty much provider applied. Um, FMP isn't going to do that, but there are, you know, different medications for that. But there's not, you know, that many medications for STDs. Don't get too overwhelmed with it. Okay, any other questions before we end? Uh, do you need to know the doses? No, I'm not going to require you to know the doses of the medication. Okay, if there's nothing else, then I'm going to go ahead and log out. and hope you have a... a Good rest of your Martin Luther King holiday and uh, stay warm. <laughs> Bye.